Um, we're going to table the discussion uh, for the next uh, for 30 minutes because our next caller is on the air. Uh, she is probably one of the most well-known libertarians in the movement, probably uh, one of the co-founding members of, believe it or not, the Association of Libertarian Feminists, a co-founding member back in the day, and also a co-founding um, partner and, and member, and she's um, also um, a, a current executor, um, executive director of ALF. And also, she's a co-founding member of uh, SafeFairBooks.com, and she's yep. a wonderful activist, a, a wonderful libertarian feminist all the way around. Please welcome our very good friend, Sharon Presley. Sharon, you with us. Dr. Presley, welcome. Hi there. Glad to be on the show. Hi. Oh, no problem. No problem. Thank you for coming on. Um, I guess uh, the, I guess the, uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, ask you, how did you actually find your way into the libertarian movement? I mean, you, your career has spanned within the movement has been around, been around long before I even showed up on the scene. Yeah, I mean, you're for, 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 for well over, for you over 30 years. Well, she was in preschool when she did it. Too. Uh, yeah, right. Uh-huh. That's right. Don't forget that. Um, well, I was in college at the age of four, of course, and a friend has suggested I read Atlas Shrugged. Like so many activists from the 60s, it began with Ayn Rand. Sure. And it was a real revelation to me. I had in a, some implicitly been looking for something to make the world made, make sense. And that seemed to right. make sense to me because I'd always been an implicit individualist. Right. So um, <clears throat> I took a couple of the NBI courses uh, that were recorded in San Francisco and then in 1964, when the Goldwater campaign came along, I was, I, I was at University of California at Berkeley at the time. I'm walking across campus, and there at the entrance to the university, lo and behold, is a Cal Students for Goldwater uh, table. And I started talking to the people. And at that time, the conservatives right. and libertarians thought they could kind of coexist. Also, of course, it's important for people to understand the conservatives in the 1960s were not as nutty as they are now. Goldwater was quite reasonable. He wasn't completely a libertarian, but he definitely had one foot in the libertarian camp. He was pro-choice. He was a four gays in the military. And, in fact, his speech, nominating speech, at the convention that year was written by a libertarian, Carl Hess. And so it was easy right. for us libertarians to to be uh to be in favor of him. That's when I first became politically active. Then after that uh, uh after the election, uh we formed Cal Conservatives for Political Action. But by a year later, it became obvious right. to us libertarians that not enough libertarians were like Gold. I mean, not enough conservatives were like Goldwater, and too many were like the John Birch Society. So we pretty much started dropping out. We um, had a chapter of Young Americans for Freedom that was called the Moy Shambe chapter. Right. We were kicked out for libertarian deviations. Uh, and I mean that literally. And we formed our own group, right. um, uh, the Alliance of Libertarian Activists. So Did you that, happen to run into Dana Rohrabacher while you were oh, at sure. it? I mean, I knew because Dana. He was a, yeah, he was a member of uh, he was a member of CCPA, uh, not right. not ALA, but C, C, CPA. And he was, shall we say, a trifle more radical though in those days than he is now. Um, <laughs> right. No, say it ain't so. Because <laughs> he 
was a libertarian um, then. <laughs> I'm shocked. Oh, I'm sorry. That'd be I'm nuttier than a fruitcake now. <laughs> oh, they're oh, a lot worse no, than him. Just... Oh, yeah, I know. Um, but uh, I guess, uh, you know, I'm... I'm I, I, I have to admit, your, the organization that you're currently serving as the, the executive director of the Association of Libertarian Feminists, uh, you started, I mean, you, well, you didn't, um, you didn't actually come up with the idea. Uh, Tony no. Nathan did. That's right. Tony Nathan, who, as some of you may know, but you is- were, but, but, right, but you were the, one of the principal people behind the scenes with her. And, well, no, um, yes, she came up with the idea in 1973 while she was in Oregon. It, but the 1975 well, it, it, Libertarian it, it, Party Convention was in New York, and that's when we all got together and officially formed a national organization. And, and that's, that's where I, first, I came I first in. met Tony Nathan in Oregon, actually. Um, she's, she's one of the few libertarians still in Oregon. <laughs> Yeah, she. I hope everyone listening knows that she was the first woman to get an electoral vote. To get an electoral. And Absolutely, also, yes. Yeah, in right. case she was also the first Jewish person. That's right. And so, really? oh, okay. so the Democrats had to back down on being first on both those counts. So, and, Harold, when Geraldine Ferraro passed away recently, they there were a bunch of uh, obituaries that improperly credited her um, and ignored the fact that Tony Nathan actually was the first for many of those things. Yeah, what a surprise! Actually, Geraldine Ferraro was the first mafioso. Actually, Ferraro was the first mafioso to get electoral votes. Yeah. <laughs> it was Tony Nathan. I'm sorry, but, that was so not yeah. right. Well, we have a right the on the Alf movie. website, so. Right. Right. But, you know, I, I guess, you know, um, exactly how strong is ALF today? I mean, um, is, uh, has it, you know, have, have there been more members than there are now, or has there been a decline in the membership? Because uh, well, I think... It's a, it's a, fair, a fairly informal organization, and also... Most of us have been busy with other concerns. Now I'm trying to build it back up again because now that I'm retired from at least from my last career, uh, I have more time to spend on it. But no, we uh, I think we're we're gaining. I think we're gaining in strength. Uh, the uh, every time I look at our Facebook page, there's more people joining in, and so that I. I think that's important, and I think more and more people, both men and women, are recognizing that feminism, libertarian feminism makes sense, that you can't have a revolution without the women, and that you can't have liberty for just for the guys. You have to have liberty for the women, too. And that's really, right. and as you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what feminism means. Uh, mostly, I think, from right. people who've never looked into it, and they start frothing at the mouth about women who want to use the state. What? As And how are they any different from 90% of the rest of the population who want to use the state? Why do right. they get so upset about women? That that's a right. well. Okay, I have to jump in there because I actually just had a recent conversation. I was I was a guest. Uh, I called in on uh, Flaming Freedom, which is a, a gay libertarian podcast, and uh, some friends of mine run that. Which is yeah. run. Which, by the way, and, and I and I need to note this on the record here. It's run by Dell uh, Everett, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and and, uh, and that particular that particular uh, podcast uh, night, it was also it was co-hosted by. A friend of mine, Elizabeth Edwards, and she was talking about feminism, and it actually had an interesting discussion because I look at my generation. I'm 42 now, so uh, but I think there's a large number of men that grew up very comfortable with being natural feminists who now look at what the word has turned into in the mainstream. And I'm not saying that we're against equality by any means, but the word feminism has very much been co-opted by the left 
to mean a statist making things you evil. Mean, well, right, it's been co-opted. Well, it's been largely co-opted by the Catherine McKinnons and the Andrew Dworkins. Right. The world. But but so, feminism in this country, of course, has a very long tradition, and most of it has not been pro-state except wanting the vote, which I think in the context is perfectly reasonable. Um, the uh, 19th century feminists were very much individualist, and some of them were very libertarian. So it's not like right. we, we're kind of jumping on the, somebody else's bandwagon. And what I also say to people is, look, you don't believe what you read in the media about libertarians, do you? So why do you be- believe what you read about feminists? Because, of course, the most sensational, most extreme ones are going to get the most press. That's the way the press works. Right. When there are lots of, you know, middle of the road, you might say, feminists, who are not as extreme as the Dworkins or the McKinnons. And women, for instance, are involved in feminists for free speech, um, you know, who are very much in favor of free speech. Joan Kennedy Taylor, the late Joan Kennedy Taylor, who used to be uh, our uh, national coordinator, as we called it at that time, was involved in Feminists for Free Expression. They were a great group. So there's lots of women out there that are not gung-ho on using the state. And, And so this, but what I say is you've got to look at what feminism means. You can't just judge the larger concept by what a few people do. I mean, what if right. people judge libertarianism by some of the nut jobs that are in the libertarian movement? That you never know. happens. What are you talking about? I won't name names here. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you, you I will. all can I will. think of some people. Well, um, no, I completely agree with you, and that was actually the point that Elizabeth was making in the podcast. She She talked about wanting to reclaim feminism to, to take it back from the people who had co-opted it on the left and yeah. bring it back. So it sounds like your organization is doing that, and I'm thrilled that, that people like Elizabeth are, are uh, yet another generation that are starting to come up and, and get involved in those well, kind of things. Well, well what about um, – yeah, you've also got somebody like uh, Stephanie Murphy who is yeah. a – uh, who does park therapy uh, and, as well as she does her contributions to Free Talk Live, for instance. Uh, she is one of, probably one of the popular known uh, libertarian feminists in the movement, and she really makes a lot of very salient points about, you know, how women are being, you know, perceived in society and whatnot. I think that's that's very crucial. By and the way, it, oh, yeah. Speaking of Stephanie, she's one of uh, over uh, nearly two dozen people who are writing for a libertarian feminist anthology that I'm putting together. Excellent. It's uh, and it's about oh, right. social <laughs> policy. No, let me you ask you. To um, wait a minute! Don't both of you talk at once? I can't hear you. <laughs> I was asking, when do you expect the anthology to come out, Professor? Well, it's not done yet. It probably won't be done before the end of the okay. year. So, um, okay. But believe me, we'll advertise it for money. It'll come out sometime oh, next sure, year. Sure. Oh, so sometime okay. during the either the Mitt Romney or Obama term, right? <clears throat> that was awful. Oh, yeah, no, well. no, 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 Gary Johnson. <laughs> Let's correct that right now. Gary Johnson. Because people are going to wake up and go, yeah, I'm not going to vote for either Obama or Romney. You just have to keep that in your mind. Just keep that in wow. your mind. Wow. Um, and I'll click my heels three uh, times, and I'll know. be back in Kansas. <laughs> so, well, no, you need to I, move to New Hampshire. New Hampshire is the new libertarian homeland. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, that's true. That's true. That is your free yeah, state project today, and, and my kudos to you for so being. It might, by the way, it might be a good, while well, we're talking about libertarian feminism, it might be good to maybe in, in some way define it. I mean, feminism really is just about seeing women as equal, seeing women as individuals instead of judging by stereotypes. Right. That's really the essence. And equality before the law 
and uh, psychological equality. That's really what it has historically been about, whether or not the name feminism was used. And that's really what it means. And all these other things are just variations. We have different kinds of libertarians or different kinds of feminists. Now, what's different, what's different about libertarian feminism is that uh, the obvious thing, we don't want to use the state to gain our ends. Um, the liberal feminists want to uh, enact laws. We want to repeal them, you know. And, but what we have to do to make it palatable to the average consumer is present alternatives. And that's what I've been working on lately. And, and we'll, we will have some of that in this anthology. Um, what do we do if we don't have the state? And obviously there's been a lot of discussion of that for many years, not as much as I think there should be, uh, because we have to translate our theories into action and into alternatives. Right. But uh, I think oh. it's very important, and that's what I'm going to be talking about at Libertopia. Oh, that's excellent. Um, I, I guess the big, um, I'm, I guess the, the the big question I was going to ask you here, um, Sharon, is, well, you know, a few years ago, Aleph B, the um, Life Safe Airbarks, was basically at one point went out of business, but ISL took over and bought out. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm not mistaken, no, that's correct. correct. In fact, I was I was actually uh, I was I actually at one point uh, built a temporary website for them as they were kind of phasing from 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 the old to the new, um, and then uh, obviously um, Vince at ISL um, ended up passing away, and that changed some plans. And but there was a, there was a period there where where actually I was hosting I was hosting the uh, the, the new LFB site at one point. I built it. Yeah. Well, then, then at some point, my partner Art Smith became the webmaster. So uh, yeah. I have been following all right. of this pretty closely, and now it's, uh, of course, been bought out by Agora Financial. And right. I have mixed feelings. On the one hand, it's reaching more people than it's ever reached before, but let's just say, if I were doing it, I would do it somewhat differently. Well, I, I can speak um, to this, Alan Turin, uh, and I'll I'll date myself on this one. Um, I'm remembering when I used to get my copies of the Lizzie Fair uh, book um, catalog mailed to me. I, for those of you too young to remember, there was a point where the government would deliver publications by mail. It's just a fascinating <laughs> thing, and it was it was it was like a broadcast of Radio Free Europe, except it was libertarian. You know what I'm saying? It was it was. The whole right. world. It was, pr- it was printed words. Our vision was it, in printed all... words that communicated messages. Oh my goodness! I know, yeah. I know. It's shocked, oh my I'm shocked, god! Shocked, you know? And physically, but physically delivered. Okay. And, and my point is that, that I can't do it by phone, but if, if I could, I'd be shaking Professor Presley's hand, you know, and say thank you. Um, and I, I remember so clearly receiving these things, and then they'd be passed around a handful of libertarians I knew. Uh, when I was young and, and fully haired, and uh, I, to tell you the truth, this is a red letter day because I'm getting a chance to talk to Professor Presley. So I'm just well, thank you very much. I just want to say thank you. Yeah, um, Jim, uh, my partner and uh, and crime and co-host, uh, you got any questions for um, Sharon? Um, yeah, sure. I just wanted to say I've been an admirer. I've read a lot of things you've uh, written over the years on different publications and on the Internet as well, so I'm thrilled you're on the show. Um, just wondering a little bit more about um, this anthology that's coming out. Who's going to be publishing that, and when will that be uh, available for purchase? We don't have a publisher yet. <clears throat> uh, I have learned from years of being around the publishing business that you don't go looking for a publisher till you have the book. Um, that's the best way to sell it. We're going to be talking to Cato about the possibility of co-sponsoring it. And but I, one way or another, I will find a way. Um, right. 
but we have we have the majority of the articles now, but there's still a lot of work left to do. And it's it's really well. We're going to have some theory stuff because you got to start with theory. Charles Johnson and I are writing a, an essay about libertarian feminist theory, and then a number a number of other people are commenting on aspects of uh, theory. But and we're also going to have a couple of historical articles about the history of of individualism and anti-statism uh, from women. I'm writing one about uh, women resistors in, in uh, um, libertarian feminists in the 19th century, um, and then then the rest of it is going to be policy issues. We have the usual economic stuff, you know, like affirmative action and pay equity, but we also will have um, will have stuff on welfare on health care, uh, we'll have right. stuff on, uh, actually, on psychological issues. Wow, imagine that, a libertarian book with psychological what? stuff. Um, I'm writing... Well, you, I mean, you, you're qualified to write it, obviously. <laughs> well, well uh, that's true. I, I'll be, I myself will, uh, will write several of the essays. Um, I'll be doing one on non-authoritarian child-rearing and its importance. And then, let's see, what else do we have? We have um, Jim Perrin is writing on gay marriage. Uh, another article, oh, Steve, uh, Steve Horwitz is writing on uh, parents' rights. Um, we also have an article on children's rights. And uh, well, and an article by um, by Steve and by Sarah Squire together on marriage and suggesting that it should not be a state. Uh, You're that's preaching preaching right to the choir for me. I had a bill uh, last year to get government completely out of marriage to have essentially civil unions for everybody here in New Hampshire and leave marriage as a uh, religious slash cultural um, structure that basically the state would no longer do marriage licenses, and uh, I actually had some bipartisan support on that. Unfortunately, both the left and the right uh, make a huge issue out of this and are able to fundraise, and so therefore neither side, whether the pro marriage equality or the or or the anti same sex people, basically want to. Sure come to the to the middle because they make a lot of money at it. Yeah. So actually, that's no. really, I have a question, oh for, have a question for you, Sean. Sharon. Uh, um, so, you know, you, you named a number of things there that I don't think people would associate with feminism, to put quotes around it. They're not women's issues. They're more generic issues. And and that gets kind of to, to what my issue was. The reason I even called in, uh, as I mentioned uh, on that other show, um, was – because the word feminism has been co-opted, what about other words like egalitarianism or something else? No, you know, what, no, no, I'm going to defend the use of the word feminism. Good, good, I want to hear it. <laughs> because women are the ones who are still, in many ways, secondary citizens, even in this country. But if you look at other countries, that's, if that's you look at true. Asia or the Middle East, they're they're worse than secondary. They almost don't count, and they're the, almost. They uh, so yes, we st- and they they are seen as almost non-human in certain parts of the world because they are women. And the problem yeah. of the way women are viewed is still even in the West is still. If anyone thinks that women are now equal in the West and there's no stereotypes, they must be living in la la land. So as long in the, in all these stereotypes about women, um, it's because they are women. And as long as that's the case, yes, we need feminism. Galitarianism it depends on what you define mean by that definition. But no, that's not good enough. Women are the ones who are secondary citizens. And therefore, we need right. feminism. 
just as I would argue that we still need women's studies. I taught psychology of women for over 20 years, and I absolutely will defend it because until very recent times, psychology was a study of men, not of women and men. And so there's a lot, and, and, most, and a lot of the studies that are about women don't necessarily make their way into the regular textbooks. So as long as there is this gap, as long as what women do is seen as less important, however unconsciously, we absolutely need feminism. We absolutely need women's studies. Well, let me ask you uh, one important. Uh, well, I, I think there's one important um, um, point that, or actually, question that brings up a very important uh, topic of paramount interest, which is what are you, um, what are your thoughts on organizations like the Independent Women's Forum and Now? I think those groups even though they're pol um, polar opposites of each other, they don't, to me, and even though there are some libertarians or some purported libertarians who work for IWF, um, I, I, I just don't think they really consistently defend feminism in the traditional, uh, you know, libertarian sense. And well, I would now, agree, and that's because they're not libertarian. Yes, there are some libertarian people involved with, uh, with um, Independent Women's Forum, but the, the organization itself is not. It's, it's basically conservative, not nutjob conservative. They're very thoughtful in many ways, so they're, um, but they're conservative. And that's why um, I was not really interested in having anybody from the uh, Independent Women's Forum right in, in this anthology. I wanted only people who actually were libertarians. Um, so my take on them is sometimes they say good things, but they're just too eager to be politically incorrect. And I have a real problem with that. When I also taught critical thinking for many years. And from a critical thinking point of view, what you have to do is look at the issues and look at the arguments and then decide, not decide on the basis of whether something is politically correct or something is politically incorrect. That's crazy. You decide on whether the arguments for one side or the other make sense. And so just because something is politically incorrect doesn't mean I agree with it. I think a lot of their stands, I'm sorry, I disagree very much because I know, I know at least as much about the research as they do, and actually in many cases more. And, you know, I just think they're wrong. But that's what I feel like they're doing, that they're just rushing to take the politically incorrect stand instead of just the stand well, that makes sense. As for now, right. I, I, well, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I think it's said a lot of good things. But, you know, it's a status organization, so that's a problem. And, yeah, they say things I agree with, and they say things I disagree with. But, you know, it's true of a lot of organizations. Which is, which is why there's oh, an ALF. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, you yeah. know, it seems to me I pretty much end up only, being, only joining groups that I'm involved in or the head of, <laughs> because then I know it'll... <laughs> then I know I'll agree with it. Well, see, right, right. Well, you know, don't get me wrong. I have some respect for, and, and I'm just saying some, you know, the word some being operative here, respect for Carrie Lucas and what her crew are doing at IWF as far as some of the ideas. Yeah, but yeah sure. I, I, but I think... You know, the problem I have with IWF overall uh, in terms of the consistency and whatnot is they tend to come off as a little too subservient to a lot of the Republican thinking. Is, and yeah, they're extremely yeah. partisan. And that's the problem there. I mean, they, 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 they cater to the John Stossel types pretty much. 
Uh, wouldn't you agree? I mean, wouldn't you concur with that, basically? Well, yeah, I have very mixed feelings about Stossel, although I actually, I think he's actually a libertarian. I wouldn't call him part of the Republican agenda, but they they definitely are too conservative for me. I, and to the extent that they have a little bit of libertarian going on, to me, it seems to me that the libertarians who are involved with it are like, what you might call right-wing libertarians. And I've always identified more with the left. <laughs> and now I, if I had to put a label on myself in that regard, I would say that I'm a left libertarian. And, and hey, preach it, sister. Preach it. I mean, I'm a left libertarian as well. well, well and I'm telling you. Not that I yeah, agree well, with yeah. all the positions uh, that are standard for left libertarians, like I believe in copyright, and let's not go down that road right now. But no, let's not, because we'll have an argument. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, well, and I, I can go I, ahead I, and say, I, I mean, I I straddle it because I'm elected as a Republican, um, but I identify as a Tea Partier and as an occupier. So, uh. <laughs> well, I, I was also going to point out that just be glad that you don't have Eric from Daryl. I'm sorry. What was that? Oh God. What happened? Hello? You were saying Eric Dondero? Yeah, I was saying just be glad you didn't have Eric Dondero calling in because he, he brags on at his increasingly shrinking uh, um, blog site uh, in numbers against, quote, left libertarians, which uh, the best I can figure out, I mean, a left libertarian is anyone successfully repudiated him. But So there's no real <laughs> ideological content to his... Uh, I his take, hate but. sectarianism. And... I'm willing to sort of fellow travel with many different kinds of libertarians as long as they are not bigots or cultists. And so I have a real problem with that, you know, of attacking some other faction. Well, you know, I... It's like the the Trotsky split split over again. Right. Well, I um, I didn't need to put my foot into it, but I mean, <laughs> I'm not. I'm sorry. Well, that's all right. Um, but you know, here's another interesting point that I brought up on my um, on my Facebook notes recently about this whole big age-old confrontation between uh, pro-choice and pro-life libertarians over the abortion issue. Oh, and yeah. we were having this, and I thought a lot of the arguments, I thought the argument advanced by Lou Rockwell blogger Lawrence Vance was rather misguided and naive on his part. I mean, when I saw that, I'm thinking, come on, what, what pure libertarian uh, worth his salt would actually say that oh well um, that uh, women um, um, have a right to um, unless there was a, a medical condition where um, you know uh, uh, the, 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 the the unborn child if you will was actually in, 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 in danger, and it was having an umbilical cord wrapped around its neck, and it was going to die upon delivery, and, the, and it was putting the mother's life at risk under those conditions. I mean, we're talking about life and death situation there. Uh, exactly what um, what um, libertarian worth of salt would actually go on record saying, or at least not on record, but in private, would actually say that uh, women have a right to choose to abort their child a day before delivery. I mean, I Well, you know, I don't that's know like the lifeboat case. And I don't think you can start from the lifeboat case. You have to talk about principles and then, ta- and then look at where those principles lead to. Because uh, what I – and also th- there's something else that seems to be – to often not be really looked at. 
And some people have accused me of utilitarianism because of it, but I'm sorry. Uh, principles are not floating abstractions out there in the ether. It seems to me that the point of principles is to come up with a way to make life work well on Earth. Uh, they're not something independent of that. And I, you know, um, I think that's probably a fairly Randian position, although I didn't look at it that way. So, if you're the principles lead to misery for millions of women and children, then there's something wrong with the principle. Exactly. And that's what I say about the anti-abortion. I refuse to call them pro-life because um, they're only in favor of the life of the fetus. They do not care about women, and they do not care about the born children. Um, they are obsessed with the fetus, and I just think that's, the wrong way to look at morality that women matter and their children matter and what and i also never see the uh, anti-choice people looking at they always they always seem to think that the women who get abortions are like frivolous women who are irresponsible and don't use birth control and that is absolutely not the case and they also ne- oh, never look at anything except Americans when, in fact, we've got 20 million women seeking illegal abortions in other parts of the, uh, the world. And not because they were frivolous and didn't use birth control, probably because they didn't even have access to it in the first place. And they've already got so many mouths to feed that one more would just make the situation even worse, and 68,000 of them die every year from the aftermath of illegal, unsafe abortions. And the anti-choice people do not care about those women and those children who will go hungry. And my position, uh, I mean, I have a whole argument for abortion, which you can find either on my Facebook page. Well, actually, uh, my Facebook page has a later version of what's on the Alf website. Um, Right. If, if you espouse a principle that results in that much misery, there's something wrong with it. Agreed. And uh, yes. so that's more important than this lifeboat case of are you going to can do you have the right to kill a fetus the day before it's born? No, but the cases of that could probably be counted on the fingers of one hand because it's very very dangerous, and it's only done in the case of uh, where, because of the way the, the fetus is positioned, uh, it, right. to have the fetus delivered would kill the woman. And then, yes, it's Well, done. right. You've got organizations like Libertarians for Life, you know, Doris Gordon, who actually believe, and I used to be associated with that group a long time ago, um, you know, where... You would have people like her and even some of the the, the people on the Ron Paul camp or even in the conservative camps who would say, well, you know what, Uh, life begins at conception. Well, Well, I don't believe, well, yeah, but life is one thing, being a person is another that's a big sleight of hand. I want to I want to jump in here because I've got I've got some real world experience with this because I actually had to sit in the last year and press the red or the green button quite a few times on these issues, and you know we had a we had a good sized libertarian uh, coalition in the in the New Hampshire House. I mean we easily had you know even on the most radical libertarian votes we were pulling 40 people out of 400 i mean to say that you know we had 40 people that would support a radical libertarian position probably made us one of the largest libertarian bodies out there um and yet on this issue on the issue of 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 abortion and and everything that, that connects to it so that includes parenthood that included parental notification i mean all of these different things we actually had votes on a lot of these because stem cell research Yep. So, so, uh, so th- my point is, is that even with that group, we were split down the middle. We had people that we agree on everything else, and on this one we could not agree because really what it comes down to is, I'm convinced, it's what you start with 
This is not one that can be won by either side making arguments that you get people that come up with a moral position and that's where they continue to stick. Well, so I'm not going to disagree with that. In fact, what psychologists now are seeing more and more, in fact, I'm, I'm starting to read a book uh, that discusses this very subject, um, and most people's views on most things are based on emotion, not on reason. Exactly. And that's one of the problems that the libertarian movement has because it's so got its head in the clouds and wants to only talk about reason. Well, exactly. that's wonderful. I believe in reason, but it, you have to have reason with an emotional appeal. Otherwise, we're going nowhere. Absolutely. And, and so, that's you know, a big, big right. problem exactly. with the libertarian so, so movement. On this issue, for instance, I consider right. myself right. to be pro choice. So I consider myself right. to be pro choice. Wait a minute. Don't, right. don't right. talk. Ty, what'd you say? Well, I was going to say it goes deeper than that because, you know, I love how when you've got the 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 the, the pro life side, you know, like the side that says, well, I believe that you know the child should not be aborted. It should be a crime to actually kill the unborn child so it can grow up to become a Republican. Uh, no offense intended, Seth. But, uh, but you know, this is the side where they say, well, why, um, um, science can demonstrate that life begins at, at, at conception. Okay. I'm not really um, I'm convinced of that argument, but even can if that is the actual can I say something argument. But, but well, before you do, I just want to point out, they love to cherry pick what is science and what isn't science, okay, especially from considering abortion is fueled by religion. They'll say, well, uh, dinosaurs and cavemen in the Big Bang Theory, it's all made up by scientists, but, you know, everything in the book of Genesis is true. Yet when it comes to, say, the, uh, the issue of abortion when it comes to science, well, there you have it. Um, science is proven that. They, well, the, 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 why, why is it that they pick one part of science and dis, 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 disregard the rest? You know I mean, they the want answer their to that. Eat. Well, uh, uh, but I'm not, even, I'm not even saying that that's, what, that that's what gets said. So, so give me, I mean, I want to come back to some concrete examples. So, I, as I said, I'm pro-choice. We had okay, a bill but to may I with, say something sure, here? Sure, I'm going to please, butt in. You please. guys yeah. listen to me. The, no one is okay. disputing that the fetus is human or even that it's alive. Hey, no kidding. The DNA is human. That is not the issue. And this is where their sleight of hand or sleight of word comes in because there's a difference between it being human and being a person. Persons have rights. The fetus is not a person. And, you know, they can, they can bring in, j jump through various hoops, and it won't work. Because you know what the Oxford Unabridged Dictionary says a person is? A self-conscious or rational being. And in order... Well, then how are corporations persons? Uh, forget about that. I want to get <laughs> off of that issue. Okay. And, the, the and what re reason is the intellectual power or faculty which is ordinarily employed in adapting thought or action to some end. I'm quoting here. And so that is a person is an organism that can engage in what psychologists call purposeful action and what philosophers call making choices. And psychologists, right. and by the way, I taught developmental psychology for over 20 years. The, the, yeah. From that, from a psychological point of view, the, the necessary condition for rationality and self-consciousness is capacity for cognition, and that does not happen till after birth. It happens immediately at birth. So don't anyone think that this is an argument that says you could kill newborns? No, at the moment of birth. And I have quotes here from developmental psychologists that say. The, for instance, and here I'm quoting, the birth of the child is marked by two fundamental changes in, in its functioning. It is now subjected to states of imbalance, deprivation, discomfort that must soon be repaired, 
and he encounters a variety of events and experiences which shape his perception of the event and his reactions to it. These states are important psychologically, for they force the infant to do something to alleviate the, the discomfort. And right. that's a quote. And, and I was saying that is to engage in purposeful action, and that a fetus does not engage in purposeful action. Well, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in and say that number one, even with the definitions you read, I could see someone saying, "But what about two weeks before birth, three weeks before?" And that's the argument that happens, unfortunately. Okay, and I know that we end up with we end up with the sliding scale. Right. Yeah, and I, and so I have another argument that's also important because I don't think that fundamentally that the issue depends on science. It depends on a concept of rights. I agree. And I fall back on an old libertarian right. tradition, the one uh, uh, the person as a free moral agent with sole dominion over his or her life. That means they have a right to make choices uh, necessary to their desired emotional or, or psychological right. state, I, yeah. the right, right to control their own body. Exactly. And so to interfere with self-determination is to deny human moral agency. You're absolutely right, and I want to come back to the point I tried to make twice before and actually make it now. So here's the thing. So I consider myself to be pro-choice. One of the bills we had before us in New Hampshire this, uh, in the last two years was parental notification. So here's someone who is not legally an adult, who we say is not able to contract for themselves, is not legally responsible for themselves. And what was happening was is that they were able to get an abortion uh, despite that without, well, you know without the parent knowing. And I believe that, that children have rights too. And if a child, quote, unquote, a teenager is old enough to get pregnant, they're old enough to make their own decision about whether they want to carry that child or not. It is not the right of the parents to decide. It is the right of the person who is pregnant. The, and I agree with girl. you. I agree with you. However, however, that 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 teenager is not legally responsible for themselves. They're not responsible well, for a hospital. Wait, wait, let me finish. Well, let me finish. If if the bill had been parental consent, I would have voted against it for exactly the reason you said that it's not up to the parent. But this was parental notification. Let me, Does the let parent me tell have the you right why I think that's no. a bad idea. Because some parents are rabid fundamentalists who would be do very ugly things to their child if they found out she was pregnant. And that young girls who get pregnant, many of them are scared to death of what their parents will do. Beat them. Who knows what they do? Force them to carry the child? I don't know. Lots of ugly things. There are plenty of stories out there. And that's why I don't believe in the right to parental consent. It is the girl's body and the girl's body only, period. Uh, and, again, I agree with you on consent, but notification. And, and, and I agree with you. notification. Wait, wait, wait. I agree with you that there are parents out there that would go overboard, that would be detrimental for the, for the child to know, which is why this, this particular bill had the ability for, for a child to say, I don't want my parents okay. to know and get a judge to do it. But, but, see, that's my point. You see, all of these things are not black and white. And what, we, what I keep finding happens with libertarians is we love to make black and white arguments. The real world is not black and white. And then the worst part is on these issues we're split. We don't. Need, when we start talking about free markets, we can get most libertarians to go, "Yeah, free markets good." We talk about abortion, we're split right down the middle, and that's why we have these arguments back and forth. We have libertarians for life that say, "No, the other side's wrong," and we have people like you that are saying, "I mean." This, this split is not a libertarian split. I think that's my point. We're making libertarian arguments over an issue that has nothing to do with libertarians because you can make solid libertarian arguments on both sides. You can't make feminist arguments on both sides. I, don't, I do not believe oh, yeah. that you can be... Um, okay, as an individual decision, fine. But anybody, libertarian or otherwise, who says... We should have laws against abortion, preventing it. That person is not a feminist, period. I've thought about this for a long time. 
I, I'm willing to concede that you can be a libertarian, although I have some reservation even about that. But no, they can't be a feminist because a feminist is pro-woman and understands that a woman has rights, a right to her body, a right to her mind, a right to her life, and that laws against abortion abrogate that. So, this is Alan here. I was going to say, sorry, just for two interrupted apologies. My point I was going to make is I, I couldn't recall having rejoined the GOP in the R with the Republican Liberty Caucus about 20 years ago. I went to several young Republic. I could still go to young Republican meetings, and and I saw the same thing that Seth is talking about. And um, I remember making the argument more than once. I said, you know, as, as you know. If we concede everything okay. that, that the, the anti-abortionists say is true, there is something that's worse, and that is the world we had before we had legal abortion. And it seems to me that this is this is a, absolutely goes right. And I, I'll probably sound utilitarian here: is that if I can, even if I were to concede arguendo for the moment that life, the, that a human person is created, okay, at conception. And that should be protected until term. When that was the notion of our laws and our customs in our country, there was an awful lot of mischief and evil and bad things happening because women did need or sought out abortions. Only now it was in the black market. Right. And if anyone forgets about that or if anyone tries to ignore that history, it, it, you come at a peril. So, you, I, you know, I know lots of uh, pro-choice people, I mean, to be pro-life people and wouldn't want my sister to marry one, but I mean, the point is, as nice as I thought they were, I think they were tone deaf to, to, if not recent history now, certainly history that's in living memory. And that is, what was it like when the law said, well, you know, Jane is, is pregnant, what's she supposed to do? Well, she doesn't want to have the child. Well, too bad, so sad, or go to New York, or, or whatever. The, if you, anyone recalls this, or has someone who can remember it, there is a good reason for having legal abortion. <laughs> that is the evil that we had when we had it outlawed. And, yeah, and the evil that right. we still have in other parts of the world. I, I, as a feminist, yes, I well, don't want to be yeah. you know, American-centric. There are women dying, and uh, as I said before, the, the statistics uh, from the World Health Organization, 68,000 women sure. a year dying from illegal abortions, and a couple million more who um, either get infections, and many yeah. of them oh, become yeah. sterile and can't have well, more children. There are a lot of negative consequences. My, my, well, let, let me answer. I'm not this from France. Well, um, um, go ahead, Alan, and let me make my final point on this one. I was going to say, my mother, was, my mother was, was born in France, and she was raised by my, my grandparents, her parents, in French North Africa. Today, that garden spot called Algeria, okay? And, and Algeria is not as bad as the rest of the Middle East if right. for no other reason than there's some connection to Europe, okay? Right. But you don't have to wander very far from Algeria to see the mischief. You just go a little bit south, or you just go a little bit east, and the fit hits the Shan frequently, okay? And then we have the happy places like Romania in the olden days, when the old Kishescu regime said, we need more Romanians. You don't yeah. have abortions. You have orphanages, okay? Well, there was a happy little uh, experiment in social engineering. The, the mischief that Dr. Presley's talking about is real, live, and nasty in so many places, well, I don't want to sound chauvinistic here, but, you know, it's good to remember the consequences of having more freedom. We believe as libertarians we have a better civilization with much more freedom. Yeah. But we can also see that demarcation line in several places, and it is nasty with a way that is almost beggar's description. That's right. Well, That's here's... Um, I promise Todd would be nice. Okay. Now, here's a here's a situation as as I see it, which is you've got a lot of people on this side, which is a highly politicized 
issue by itself. Um, so a lot of them would say, you know, well, we can't abort a fetus, particularly when we're talking about, you know, this this matter all the way around. But then, you know, I love it when a number of conservatives go on this argument about, well, uh, women who raise children out of wedlock and there's no uh, father in the picture, well, uh, a number of them would say, well, they should have just kept their legs closed. And I'm sorry, but that just um, plays right into the hands of that chauvinistic, sexist men- mentality and well, that kind of... It also of, forgets of that people rhetoric. grow up. It also forgets that people grow up. Okay? I mean, I mean you know, sometimes people are, make decisions that are going to have irrevocable uh, consequences in their lives. Like, oh, let me think, a young man who enlists and lies about his age so he can, he can, you know, die for God and country. Well, he comes back maimed, you know, um, and he was 17, you know. Um, yes, of course, you know, if, if, if our girl in the example that we're going to give, you know, if she had been more prudent, yeah, okay. You know, great. You know, if, if, you know, if I had not drunk as much as I did when I was 19, I wouldn't have been having a hangover the next day. This is, people make decisions. It's just that it's a heck of a lot more consequential. I had a headache, okay? I felt right. sick. Well, there's also Ms. something Jane, else I'd like to point out people. here. There's, there, as I say, there's yes, very many a- anti-choice people couch this as if the woman were being irresponsible. Well, excuse me, there is, even if she's using birth control, which is probably the majority of cases, it doesn't matter. There is no absolutely perfect means of birth control other than not having sex. And really, so what this boils, you know, you, you could be as responsible as you could possibly be. You still have a chance of getting uh, pregnant, even with a pill, but a lot of women can't use the pill for medical reasons. So if they're conscientiously using the means of birth control to get pregnant, tough shit. You know, it's not only is it yeah. anti-women, it's anti-sex, too. There's a lot of puritanism right. left over from right. earlier exactly. times. Right, exactly. There is this, uh, this puritanical, dogmatic mentality that is largely propagated by the Catholic Church. And it really uh, pisses me off to no end because this is is where the Catholics have dropped the ball on. They really have turned their back. I mean, to me, they are pretty much fueling the war on women mentality that has been part and parcel of this. And on altar boys. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry. That was really uh, sorry. I, I apologize. I, sorry. Well, that, that, but but there is a lot of truth in that because you know, I mean, we're talking about the same church that's been rocked with you know uh, the pedophilia scandals within the last few years, but you know, but this is the the same organization within Christianity, and Christians tend to come off as very much hypocritical on this because they think they have the monopoly on morality. Excuse me, you don't have the motherfucking monopoly on morality here. Morality is, to me, as the way I see it, is highly subjective. If you don't like the fact that a woman is getting pregnant, that's your problem. Women are going to make uh, make choices. They're going to make mistakes along the way, but it's theirs to make if they make a mistake. And the fact of the matter is, for you to say that they will not have an abortion because it offends your moral sensibilities, I'm sorry, but you need, um, you, you really need to take your head out of your ass. Um, but, uh, but, um, but, uh, here's you're, you're the, the, to the choir, Tom. I, mean. I know, um, <laughs> but, uh, one final, um, uh, thought here, Sharon, we need to let you go here, but, um, what would your, what would you say to a lot of the Republicans and Democrats 
who are fostering the war on women. I mentioned this about a couple of minutes ago. Is there a war on women? Yes, I think there is. Yeah. Because Uh, it's a very selective use of these kinds of arguments. And they're against women. Um, You know, and especially when it comes to sex, there is still hiding there in people, some people's consciousness the idea that a woman who has sex outside of marriage is a slut. And right. Like the slut walk that happened last year, wasn't it the year before? When it, was, it was either last year or the year before. But you know, I had to, I've heard a number of conservatives like on Sean Hannity who were basically saying, oh, well, this is actually disgusting. These women need to take personal responsibility, and they're sending out the wrong message to women. No. Like, you women are actually... Uh-huh. Like, like you people are actually sending a really great uh, message to women, anyway. Oh, you know, uh, as a psychologist, I look at so many of these rabid right wingers, and it's like I have to keep trotting out Freud over and over again. And I'm not a big fan of Freud because he had a really ridiculous view of women, but on some things he was really right. You know about reaction formation. That's when unconsciously something that you really want. Is is supposedly bad, so you turn it into its opposite consciously. So if you yep. uh, want sex, you became you become anti pornography, or in, in some cases, even if you are afraid you're gay, even if you're not, but if you're afraid you're gay, it yeah. becomes right. homophobia. I see so much of that on right. the right. Well, and, I think that's true, but I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here and say that the left does its own damage to the oh, to the very same causes. Absolutely. So, well, look at what just happened. Where oh well, I want my birth control to be paid for by the state. I think that that was a perfect case where libertarians are going, no, you're totally entitled to have all the sex you want, but the rest of us aren't going to pay for it. That's right. I, and, well, I can't disagree with that, of course. And and and, and the problem is, right. is that we are stuck between these two polar opposites. We have the Republicans saying that these women are slots, and we have the left defending them and saying, don't you make moral judgments, but by the way, you better pay for it for everyone. And, and you know, it's a pox on both their houses. We need right. to sort of say, look, everybody has the right to have their own – their own moral standards, their own, you know, whatever they want to do without judgment, but at the same time, don't bring those responsibilities to the rest of us. Yep. And right. and, and that's I the problem. I, so when I hear war on women, I get very upset because I'm going, the left is accusing the right of it, and I'm going, I'm getting tainted by that, being a, a Republican who voted for some things they dislike. I voted to to stop funding Planned Parenthood because I don't believe taxpayer money should be funding the organization. Well, I agree with that. And by the way, there's another issue. And because I've been studying uh, welfare and I've been studying uh, private uh, organizations, and one of the things that comes out very clearly, and this is not just libertarians saying, is that those people who accept government money get tainted. They have to dance to the government's tune. And many, there have been a no, any yeah. number of organizations that have had to change their focus right. in order to keep right. getting money, and that um, was a big mistake. Yeah. Right. Um, you yeah. know, Sharon, I, 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 wish we, I, 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 I wish we had more time to discuss this, but, you know, um, and uh, we went way over, but it's been awesome to have you on the show. Well, thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you so much for being on the air with us, and you're always welcome to come back. It's really great to talk to you. Sure, because I have lots of opinions. (laughs) (laughs) I know you do, and and they're awesome. So I got a lot um, of opinions too, and if you don't like them, I'll change them for you. Okay, let me just give let me just give a plug for my organization, ALF dot org. We had uh, the, uh, uh, our organization and a website so early that we were the first one to get ALF, not the, American, the Animal Liberation Front, uh, ALF.org. <laughs> Good for you. Excellent. Um, uh, that's awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon. And keep fighting the good fight. We Thank need you. More, I will. We, we need more women like you the real- on, on the front lines. So... It's, Professor, it was, a, it was a real honor to have talked with you. 
Thank you very much. Take it easy, Sharon. And, okay. Uh, yep. Uh, have a good night. Okay. Um,